Well, I'll, I'll start by um, saying, of course, thank you for the invitation to uh, to come speak today um, to Solvega Krumina Kankova in particular, who reached out and I was so delighted to learn about your network and to get the invitation to come and be in conversation with you and to the Institute of Philosophy at the University of Latvia. And of course, I, I wish that I could speak to you um, in person because as everybody here probably knows, uh, many of the conversations that are most interesting kind of happen right outside of the main lecture, right? In these various interactions, um, you know, as we were just discussing now, kind of trying to explain or clarify certain points. Um, so what I want to do today is to make sure that I leave room for that conversation and for discussion and questions at the end, because um, ultimately I think this topic is so new and so kind of poorly defined still that um, it will be more productive for us to kind of come together and see where we uh, align and what kind of sense we can make of it together. So when I received the invitation to speak to the Soviet Spirituality Research Network, I was asked specifically to reflect on the concept of Soviet spirituality and to aspects that would be important to take into account in researching it. And I took that quite directly um, as an opportunity to reflect on the component parts of that Soviet and spirituality on those terms, both uh, separately, right? What is Soviet, what is spirituality, but also together, what is Soviet spirituality as a kind of concept? Um, so the first, of course, is this question of Soviet. And I'll, I'll just say a few, I just want to kind of say, I'll say a few introductory kind of remarks and questions, and then I'm going to um, show a lot of images because I want to focus on, on that aspect of it. So first of all, what is uh, Soviet, right? How do we define something as Soviet? Is it something that happens in Soviet time and in Soviet space? right? Meaning anything that happens in the Soviet period is by default Soviet. Anything that happens on Soviet space, meaning in Soviet Latvia is Soviet, right? We can kind of just stop there. Or is it something that is in its essence Soviet, right? Something that is distinct and apart and which requires then for us to agree on a definition of the term, right? What is the Soviet essence? How does it um, articulate itself and how is it distinct from other ways of being. So for example, do we include the word Soviet um, in something that defines itself explicitly as anti-Soviet, right? Like, do, uh, for example, do we count the dissident movement as Soviet or nationalism or the hippie movement as Soviet? Now, there's a very interesting book coming out by uh, my colleague Juliana First about Soviet hippies. And she makes the argument, um, indeed, that the hippie movement in its opposition to the Soviet system was itself a very Soviet product, right? So we can kind of think about these things and complicate them. So that's the first, uh, the first question is what is Soviet? Then the second is uh, what is spirituality? And this is of course uh, a very difficult contested term. It's, it's, it's really ineffable, it's hard to kind of grasp. Um, and so the question is, what do we mean by this term? What does it include and what does it exclude? And here I'm gonna just kind of go through a few things that uh, will of course not make anything clear, but actually just give us a landscape of uh, ways to complicate it. So for example, does the spiritual encompass religion, right? Is religion itself a spiritual phenomenon or does it stand in opposition to religion? For example, with the school of thought that thinks of belief versus experience. Um, so what do, if we include religion, then what do we do with that category of person who explicitly defines himself or herself as spiritual but not religious, right? So who, who, for whom that category is broken up and actually spiritual and anti-religion, who uh, anti-religious who stands against a, um, a kind of dogma and institutional uh, religion. So that question, right? Is it, it, does it include religion or is it something distinct from religion? Does it include culture, right? Does, does it include national culture, even nationalist culture? 
uh, or counterculture? Does it include hippies? Does it include um, dissidents, right? So we kind of talked about this. Do we include or exclude ideologies? Can you think of Soviet Marxism, Leninism as a spiritual phenomenon? Uh, and if so, which ones, right? Do we include Marxism, Leninism and exclude liberalism? Right? Is liberalism a spiritual phenomenon, or is it just the phenomena that are um, so-called kind of totalitarian or political religious? And finally, uh, this question of new religious movements, the so-called NRMs, and uh, new age movements, which are so, I think, critical, especially for the period that we're looking at here, which is the 1960s to 1980s. So do we include new religious movements in the category of the spiritual? For example, the Hare Krishna or yoga, uh, astrology, um, or do we uh, exclude new age movements such as ufology, right? Is ufology a spiritual phenomenon? Um, Alexander Panchenko, who I'll, I'll reference later, uh, wrote a terrific article in uh, the Russian journal uh, Nova Literaturna Bazrenia about uh, ufology as a religion, right? So kind of including it in a, in a kind of category of the spiritual. So this is a very complex term and not something that I think there's any consensus about, not just in the Soviet case, but really uh, in a much bigger methodological sense. And what makes this undertaking challenging then is the slipperiness of these categories. But what makes it interesting for me is that the actors themselves, actually, the historical actors grappled with these questions, meaning they asked these questions and they tried to answer them. And that, of course, left a trace that we as researchers can now follow by kind of thinking with them about what this means. And finally, I want to pause before starting on the, the main, uh, before uh, getting into the material, I'd like to pause on the period under consideration, that is to say, uh, the 1960s to the 1980s, because uh, as I imagine many here know, some uh, from personal experience, this period is, of course, quite distinct from the early Soviet period in terms of what it meant to be Soviet, right? It's Sovietness is something quite different than, uh, than uh, other forms of the Soviet. For example, it's most obviously distinct from the era of building socialism of the 1920s and 1930s and from Stalinism. But I would also argue that if we narrow the scope a little bit further to begin our focus in the late 1960s and then end it kind of before we get to Perestroika, then actually what we have is a period that is distinct also not just from the early Soviet period, the pre-war period, but also from the kind of Khrushchev project of building communism. And it's all of the kind of ideological mobilization that goes into that. So that by the late 1960s and certainly by the 1970s, the rhetoric of building communism has really uh, left the stage, right? There's very little conversation about building communism, even among the ideological establishment itself, which by the early 1970s has quietly renamed the project, the ideological project as developed socialism. And we'll talk about what that means. Now, what makes this period of developed socialism interesting and important for our conversation today is that this is the moment when the category of the spiritual, actually spiritual, uh, becomes central, not just among various dissident and countercultural groups in Soviet society, but within the ideological establishment itself, which begins to see the struggle for the spiritual as it kind of vaguely defines it as an important, and in some ways, perhaps most important political battleground of the time. So this is something that, um, excuse me, okay, okay. So this is something that I uh, uh, talk about in my book um, and I'm not going to kind of rehash that entire narrative um, here, but I just wanted to draw attention to the book itself in case um, this is something that interests people. So what I would like to do today is 
to move through these developments quickly in order to really land on the period of the late uh, socialist era um, and the category that interests us today, Soviet spirituality. So my plan is to first to historicize the phenomenon that we're interested in, to kind of provide a historical genealogy of late Soviet spirituality. And second, to consider uh, the variety and character of its forms and manifestations. And this is in part what I mean by the last word in the title of my talk, landscape, the spiritual landscape is kind of what makes up the spiritual in this period. And I hope that we might come out of today's presentation with at least a sketch of that landscape, of that late Soviet spiritual landscape and all of its complexity. And here I'm uh, especially grateful to follow uh, the seminar of, of Na uh, Nadezhda Belakova, my Russian colleague who presented several weeks ago and whose presentation I listened to with great interest because she already laid a very solid foundation of Soviet religious politics in this period, the 1960s to the 1980s. And it can serve as a, as a very important background for the story that I will tell today, which focuses more on the ideological apparatus, right? Rather than the kind of state structures that are doing the work of managing and understanding religion. Uh, so I'm not sure if Nadia's here today, but thank you if, if, if she is. Um, so, and then finally, I am hoping to end with an open discussion of the questions that I raised earlier about definitions and meanings about what we include and what we exclude, since I imagine that there are many here who could contribute to that conversation. And especially, as I said earlier, given the fact that this is still a very new field of research, I think we might learn more from each other um, um, than from any kind of categorical pronouncements I might make, um, which at this point I think would still be provisional. So at that, uh, I will begin um, officially uh, with the material. In October 1981, uh, Eduard Filimonov, the deputy director of the party's Institute of Scientific Atheism in Moscow, was asked by the editors of the newspaper Izvestia to respond to a letter that was sent by an ordinary Soviet citizen. This citizen was seeking clarity about the status of religion and religious rituals in Soviet life. In his letter, the author, P. Kovalev, remembered that his, that his grandmother and her friends had gone to church when he was a child, but he wondered why in the current stage of history, quote, even certain Komsomol and party members baptize their children. Even if the hypocrisy of such behavior was evident, Kovalev was still not sure how to make sense of what he called, and this is a quote, the so-called fashion for crosses and icons with which certain people decorate the red corners of their apartments." End of quote. Is it fashion, he asked, or a failure in the upbringing of Soviet people and Soviet youth in particular? These questions, he wrote, really worried him. But what worried him even more was that when he tried to raise these issues among his friends and acquaintances, when he tried to have conversations about this with them, his questions only, and this is a quote, elicited a smile as if it's nonsense, meaning that the issue itself was not worth discussing. So just to sum up, there were actually three things that worried this ordinary Soviet person writing to the newspaper. The first of these was the persistence of traditional religious rituals and that as evidence of religiosity, especially among party and um, Komsomol members for the obvious reasons. The second thing that worried him was the hypocrisy of Soviet, of certain people who were participating in religious life, but whose attraction to these religious symbols and traditions and attributes was not a, an expression of their sincere and true belief, but actually a fashion, right? So this is actually, in, in some ways, the hypocritical participants in religious life were worse than the true believers. And third, what worried him is that these ideological contradictions and hypocritical behaviors that bothered him and bothered him enough to write to the newspaper, other Soviet people, his friends and acquaintances with whom he wanted to discuss this were generally indifferent to these issues. 
Now, Kovalev's letter and significantly the publication of this letter in Izvestia spoke to both the changes in attitudes towards religion taking place in Soviet society by the early 1980s, as well as a kind of increasing confusion within the ideological establishment about how to make sense of these transformations and how to present them to the public. Just as interesting and revealing as the letter itself, then, is the published reply of Filimonov, who, as deputy director of the Institute of Atheism, was speaking for the Soviet atheist apparatus, and whose response captures some of the official ambivalence about religious and spiritual affairs in the Soviet Union. Now, Filimonov reassured Kavalov that, and this is a quote from Filimonov, in a developed socialist society, atheism has become one of the inseparable parts of the spiritual world of the Soviet persons. So he uses that category, the spiritual world, and atheism as a constituent part. Even if there are still people who have not been able to, and this is a quote, master the scientific atheist worldview. At the same time, it was impossible not to agree, he wrote, that there were, quote, certain defects in the moral and ethical upbringing of Soviet youth. For some, the atheist education they received in school did not, quote, turn into firm convictions, along with an active life philosophy on religion and its rituals. So young people were going all the way through school, through university, and had, were not coming out with the right worldview, which in turn did not uh, manifest in the right, correct social behaviors. So instead of secular paintings, um, for example, Soviet young people were putting icons on the wall, wearing crosses, visiting historical monuments of a cult character, and reading literature on religious art and architecture. All of which these fashionable Soviet youngsters, Filimonov pointed out, saw as a sign of good form, right, good taste. Therefore, Filimonov assured Kovalev, even if the revived interest in religion was actually taking place, it should not be interpreted as evidence of a religious revival as such, but rather as an unhealthy fashion driven by spiritual consumerism rather than true conviction. And I'll talk about this category of spiritual consumerism later, but just here I want to point to two kind of manifestations of it. So on the left, you see this poster of a young woman and she's asking her, um, her grandmother for her cross, she says, can I borrow your cross to wear out, right, as a kind of um, fashion, uh, as, a, as a kind of um, piece of jewelry. And on the right, you have um, this, this young man, this kind of hippie, um, uh, sitting in front of a store selling cultural products, right, so in this case, musical instruments, um, paint brushes, so kind of secular humanist activities. Um, and he's selling religious objects in the front, you know, in a kind of unofficial capacity, right? And selling icons and um, crosses and, um, and so on. So Yevdakimov explained that sociological studies had revealed a paradoxical finding. Among those who baptize their children, he argued, believers are actually in the minority. And this is a, a quote. In other words, the ritual is observed and supports the material and moral position of the church by people who, as the saying goes, do not believe in either God or the devil. So meaning people participate in religious rites, which in turn perpetuates religiosity and supports the church, but they themselves are not believers. Those who baptize their children he explained, are not religious in their beliefs and might even have a negative view towards religious institutions, but they see in baptism a beautiful popular tradition. Baptism for them is a game or a spectacle, simply an occasion to celebrate and feast and quote, no one thinks about the fact that this ritual, no matter what innovations the clergy introduces to it, remains a religious ritual that affirms the idea of sinfulness, of insignificance before God. In other words, ideas incompatible with the moral principles of the Soviet way of life. And this category of the Soviet way of life is quite important. So I wanted to just kind of underscore it. <clears throat> 
So he explained that even if this new religious fashion was not evidence of a new religious revival or new religious convictions among Soviet youth, it spoke to what he called, quote, the well-known worldview confusion in the heads of certain young people of their absence of taste, or more precisely of their Philistine tastes, or what is now called by the fashionable word kitsch. That's the end of his quote. Most of these youngsters, he argued, see in the cross they wear around their necks simply a beautiful object that has no connection with Christian religion. And moreover, these young cross bearers are convinced that fashion has no connection to a person's convictions and worldview, right? That they don't see the contradiction um, and inconsistency of their behavior. Therefore, even if this new phenomenon was not evidence of a religious revival, it was evidence of their lack of, of atheist conviction and more broadly of, the, of their spiritual emptiness, right? This kind of um, inconsistency and lack of conviction. So how did we get here and what is to be done and who is to blame? That is kind of the next, the, the, the rest of the talk. I'm going to be talking about first, how do we get here? Um, then kind of who is to blame? And finally, what is to be done? So how we get here is really the story uh, that I tell in my book. So I'll just move through it um, fairly quickly. Um, but to answer this question, we have to go back and look, of course, at how the Soviet project framed the meaning of religion and atheism and how that meaning changed over time as a result both of external factors um, like uh, domestic and foreign politics, as well as internal uh, developments. So what the ideological establishment and the atheist apparatus learned through its own efforts to overcome religion and create an atheist society. So the Bolsheviks, I, in the book, I kind of talk about the fact that the Bolsheviks understood religion as a phenomenon that was uh, consisted of three elements, uh, which, uh, which were the political, um, grounded in religious institutions, the ideological, which was a kind of religious dogma and false worldview, grounded in superstition and the supernatural, and finally, the spiritual, which encompassed values, practices, customs, um, culture that made up um, everyday life. And the party worked with religion, engaged with religion, and tried to overcome it, religion um, in, in conversation with, its, with these uh, definitions that it itself had kind of put forward. To address religion as a political problem, the party deployed administrative regulation, uh, repression uh, that, that was meant to, circum to kind of limit the autonomy of religious institutions, marginalize religion and public life, and more, most importantly, uh, undermine its political power and its uh, power to mobilize society and influence society. To address religion as an ideological problem, the party relied on propaganda, education, and enlightenment with the goal of creating a society uh, of Soviet people who had a what they called a scientific materialist worldview. This was uh, what was missing in these young people in the um, Yevdokimov uh, letter, right? That they didn't have this scientific atheist worldview. And finally, to address religion as a spiritual problem, the party used cultural tools to transform traditional ways of life into the new communist way of life. And this, of course, was this kind of broad and, and, and um, difficult to master category that we'll be focusing on today. But for the party, overcoming religion as a, as a phenomenon, right, as a set of institutions, as a way of life was actually a process. Religious institutions had to be neutralized politically before religious beliefs could be eradicated. And religious beliefs and worldviews had to be freed um, from these dogmas, from these um, um, ideas before spiritual life could be transformed. So it was really a kind of progressive idea of how to engage with religion. So the first step was to solve religion as a political problem. And I talk about this in the book. Um, uh, and I essentially make the case in the book that by the end of the uh, 1930s, religion as a political threat had been neutralized. And from that point, the continued existence of religion uh, would be on the state's terms, which Stalin sets up during the war when he establishes this new framework for dealing with religious institutions. And that remains in place 
for the rest of the Soviet period. And here I'm talking about the councils on the affairs of the Russian Orthodox Church and the council on uh, religious cults, which then combine into one council on religious affairs. And I won't dwell on this because um, Nadezhda Belyakova covered it so well in her presentation uh, and in her work in general. But what you have is his, by the time, by Stalin's last decade in power from 1943 to 1953, there's a period of relative stability on the religious front in the sense that, uh, you know, religious repressions decrease, churches are being opened again. On the, while on the other hand, the political support of atheism is gone, right? Atheism is no longer uh, uh, um, materially or politically supported. And so it becomes kind of, it basically disappears in Soviet life. But it returns under Khrushchev. And here um, is kind of where we're getting into our time period. It returns under Khrushchev, but this time as an ideological problem. Um, and so Stalin, after Stalin's death, Khrushchev seeks to place the Soviet project on new foundations with his project of building communism and the continued existence of religion in this framework uh, transformed religion into a political, uh, from a political enemy as it had been in the early Soviet period into um, an, an alien ideology that continued to exist Soviet border, uh, within Soviet borders. Right, therefore, as a stain on Soviet modernity. And um, Khrushchev, uh, you know, this is a famous, um, famous um, passage from Khrushchev's speech at the, um, at the, um, uh, from the third party program where he says, survivals like a nightmare hold sway over the minds of living creatures long after the economic conditions which gave birth to them have vanished. So religion here becomes a kind of a holdover of a former world that no longer has an economic or political base, but is just really in the minds and, and kind of uh, bodies of people who continue to adhere to it. And so this becomes the new battleground. And of course, most importantly, at this point, the people that are, are, are understood to be the carriers of religiosity are uh, older people, right? And in, from that perspective, it makes sense. They are people who were born, you know, before the revolution, who, for whom the Soviet kind of world appeared later in their life, or they had, you know, had lived somewhere where uh, Soviet life had not penetrated very deeply. And so, you know, it becomes this phenomenon that is associated with, um, you know, babushki who uh, are supposedly filling um, the churches. But nevertheless, since religion remained a fact of Soviet life, and since communism and religion were considered fundamentally incompatible, the atheist project was revitalized and revived. In fact, it was really under Khrushchev, as I kind of show in the book, that the party mobilized the most extensive anti-religious campaign in Soviet history, closing half of the country's religious uh, spaces, instituting new laws, very, very limiting uh, new laws, um, limiting the autonomy of the clergy, and of course, investing unprecedented resources in atheist propaganda, uh, propaganda and in creating a kind of robust atheist infrastructure, right? So the institutions that we think of as, as the kind of key institutions of scientific atheism, the Institute of Atheism, um, you know, the, the kind of aspects of Obshistva Znanya, uh, divisions of Obshistva Znanya, they are uh, creations of the Khrushchev era. So it was under Khrushchev that Soviet atheism was redefined from the militant atheism of the early Soviet period into scientific atheism. So how did this look and how was it supposed to look? So it was supposed to uh, look you know, in a very kind of straightforward way as a liberation from religion, right? So we have this poster that I think captures this very clearly. Uh, it's, it's um, you know, Ksvieto Gznanya, right, to the light, to knowledge. And it's a young woman, you know, Sputnik is behind her, right, kind of representing technology and science, and she's ripping off the chain with her cross on it, right, as a kind of liberation and looking up into the future. <clears throat> 
And so this was what was supposed to happen as a result of the scientific technological revolution and enlightenment measures and education to Soviet people and especially to Soviet young people. And to help that process along, there was an entire enlightenment um, um, enlightenment program that was spread um, through not just um, educational institutions, but also extracurricular institutions. So here you're seeing a lecture at the planetarium where young people, where a uh, lecturer explains to young people how rockets work and, 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 and you know, what kind of Soviet achievements in, in, in the conquest of space. So religion was supposed to be defeated by science, education, and secular culture, which would liberate the people from religion's ominous shadow. And here, um, I think this poster captures this really nicely, where you have this kind of dark shadow of religion, right, with this with this kind of uh, ominous creature holding out his arms and blocking the way to an old grandmother and her young Soviet grandson. But just behind him, if they could just manage to cross that threshold, they would join the joyous crowd um, and be able to take advantage of all of the kind of secular Soviet um, cultural um, goods like the theater and the club and the planetarium um, and so on. Um, and you know, to, to facilitate that kind of crossing over that threshold, that dark threshold, um, you know, uh, the, the party deployed uh, an entire kind of propaganda apparatus. And here, um, you know, you see this is kind of probably the most, one of the most famous posters of this, where um, the, the cosmonaut is in space and he's saying, you know, there is no God. And um, underneath you see all the religious Kind of buildings are are swaying, right? They're kind of falling, meaning they're they're almost on the way out. They're not gone yet, but they're almost on the way out. Did this approach work? Well, the short answer is no. But what's interesting is that we know that it didn't work, not just from archives and oral histories of people's personal experience, but also from the self-criticism of the ideological establishment itself, which kind of articulated its own failures. And this, I think, is quite interesting. Um, so in response, for example, to this, you know, there is no God proclamation from the cosmonaut, you have, you know, this, this uh, cartoon of uh, an atheist lecturer who's always kind of pictured in this kind of buffoonish bureaucratic, you know, uh, way um, with his, uh, with his little briefcase, and he's giving a a lecture on if there is a God, and of course, God is sitting in the front row, right? So this idea that somehow, you know, even with these proclamations, um, you can't, um, you can't quite get rid of it, right? Um, and and the critique of atheist work at this period is essentially um, uh, uh, in two kind of um, there are kind of two ways in which it's being critiqued. Uh, the first is that atheist lecturers or atheist propaganda cadres are unprepared and uninformed and, 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 and boring, right? That they don't have the religious literacy or the kind of um, uh, ability to convey the atheist message in a way that is captivating. And the second is that they're sleeping on the job, right? That they're kind of just not, they're very sluggish. They're not really doing anything. They're just kind of signing, you know, they're just filling out boxes and signing off on plans, but they're not actually doing atheist work. And this is something that gets picked up in these propaganda posters very uh, clearly. So, you know, here you have, um, an atheist sleeping in the shadows, it says in the shadow. And the shadow, of course, is the ominous shadow of religion here as, uh, as a church. And he's sleeping on, you know, a book uh, uh, on Darwinism and, and Yaroslavsky's kind of the canon of atheist literature, right? Yaroslavsky's Bible for believers and unbelievers. And then, of course, his atheist lecture plan, right? Which, um, of course, is, is kind of just on paper. Or here again, this one, the sleeping atheist is a kind of, uh, is a great trope that captures this. And this one's interesting because you have an atheist kind of sleeping at the top uh, with his plan as a blanket. And then you have um, his kind of atheistische Vaspetania and, and various atheist methodological books that he's sleeping on. And then on the bottom, you have a church service. But what's interesting is in this church service, no longer is it just these old 
uh, women, right? It's no longer just babushki, but now you have these kind of young people, right? And a kind of guy, a hippie guy with long hair and a young woman with a cross, a kind of fashionable um, young woman. And um, and then, you know, again, the kind of calling here is atheist so the atheist sleeps, but the service is is happening, right? And it's playing on the 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 a similar uh, saying about soldiers, right? So this idea that while atheists are sleeping, religion is very active. It's very um, it's continuing to act. Um, and finally, um, this, this message here is that atheism's failure is, is actually a benefit to religion, that atheism's loss is religion's gain, that it's not just about not inculcating atheism, but that bad atheism or kind of sluggish atheism, unattractive atheism actually produces attraction to religion. So here you have, again, a sleeping atheist, and then it says, людям в клуб закрыв дорогу, ты открыл тропинку к Богу, right? So this idea that all of this, you know, secular uh, institutions, the club, the lecture hall, the library, by closing them, by not being active in them, you've opened the path for people to go to uh, church. And um, and again, this, this final two are a, a terrific genre of essentially clergy, um, uh, celebrating, right, or, or thanking atheists for being so bad at their job. So here, um, uh, the 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 like the um, the um, um, saying is, "Там где клуб закрыт давно, ходят в церковь как в кино." So there, where uh, the club has been closed for a long time, people go to church as if to the the movies, right? And again, here, what's important to note is in the back, it's not old people that are going to the church as if going to the movies. It's young people, you know, with the guitar and having fun and, and joyous and so on. And again, another um, uh, another kind of uh, in the same genre of, um, of uh, atheism's kind of decline. So now turning to religion as a spiritual problem. Um, so the failure of religion to die out, even after the party's best efforts to hurry the process along with anti-religious campaigns, forced atheists to confront the complex reality of lived religiosity and to reconsider their definition of religion and their approach to atheist work. In fact, by the late 1960s, the, the atheist apparatus also became aware of a new problem, which is ideological indifference. And this problem was actually more worrisome than the continued existence of religion itself. So this is the ideological indifference are the people who kind of participate in religion uh, as a form of kind of fashion or a consumer good or entertainment, but not out of true conviction. This diagno uh, diagnosis of indifference extended both to religious and atheist worldviews, and its symptoms included political apathy, ideological hypocrisy, Philistine individualism, and spiritual consumerism. And moreover, what was even more worrisome was that uh, the ideological apparatus saw indifference spreading among Soviet society and especially among Soviet young people, which was most worrisome of all. Indeed, by the 1970s, some even worried that indifference was much more pervasive than any uh, ideological or spiritual commitments Soviet citizens had to religion or atheism. Indifference came to worry the party more than religious belief. Um, uh, in the, after decades of trying to overcome religion, Soviet atheism, uh, atheists began to think differently about why religion posed a problem to the communist project. They no, no longer saw religion as a problem primarily, uh, uh, a, a, as a primarily political or um, ideological problem, but as, an, as a spiritual problem. In the 1970s, the ideological establishment focused on the spiritual development of Soviet society and saw the production of a socialist way of life, the kind of socialistický obraz zhizny, as the final battleground for the Soviet soul, largely because they assumed that the other battlegrounds had either been won or were not efficient or not sufficient for overcoming religion. And here I want to show examples of this kind of critique of spiritual consumerism because I think it 
uh, is quite revealing in terms of what, um, how the party itself identified the problem. So we've already seen this idea of religion, of spiritual consumerism being religion as a fashion. And here's another, right? This guy who's at the beach and he's got this big cross as a, as a kind of, and the cigarettes in his back pocket. Uh, we have uh, spiritual consumerism in, in the form of religion literally becoming a consumer good Right, and here you have the, the the image we already saw of the young man um, selling religious um, objects in front of a store, but also um, uh, the image on the left, which is uh, called Kulturne Abmian, which is cultural exchange. And there you see a young man trading an icon for a pair of Lee jeans, right, with a Westerner. So the kind of Western influence and corruption here is also being signaled. And then there's, uh, and this one perhaps is most pervasive, the idea of spiritual consumerism in the sphere of rituals as somebody who um, does not act in accordance with their convictions because they lack convictions. So this is an example, right? People who baptize their children being one of the primary uh, examples of this. Here you have on protiv i ne za, prosto on atvel glaza. So he's not for and he's not against, he just looks the other way, right? While his parents take the baby to the church. Or, um, you know, this one where it says, um, у беспринципных не секрет, есть тоже принцип вроде, удобно скажут Бога нет, удобно в церковь входят. So the idea is when it's convenient, they'll say no, there's no God. And when it's convenient, they'll go to church, right? They don't have principles. The, the, their principles are this kind of ideological flexibility. Uh, again, here, the idea of that even when there are um, secular replacements on offer, young people will just do both, right? There's kind of consumerism is such that they'll do both the religious and the, a, the secular ritual. Um, and, and here it says, you know, um, this kind of hypocritical young man who both kind of has the um, socialist wedding at the, at the palace of weddings, but also has um, a, a religious ceremony and this for, for the child as well. Um, and again, this idea of, uh, of this being especially problematic when it's young people who are in the institutions that are supposed to be reproducing communist ideology, that is to say the Komsomol. And here you, know, you have this, um, this young man uh, coming out of a church and this other young woman who's been um, you know, scorned and, and it says, but he gave me his Komsomol word that he would marry me, right? And this idea of kind of someone's word being not worth anything. And then finally, this category of spiritual consumerism and hypocrisy as a kind of, um, in using religion, um, and spirituality as a tool, right? As a means to an end. So here, this idea of, um, you know, kissing an icon in order to help pass an exam, or here, you know, uh, here is a, uh, somebody who's about to do his dissertation defense, and he's asking this um, this gypsy to tell him whether he's going to pass or not, so that he can order his um, his uh, whether he should order order a banquet in advance. So. Um, one explanation, so in terms of who is to blame, one explanation was to put the blame on the family itself. So on the one hand, um, in, in two senses, on the one hand, by showing that the transmission of religion across generation is happening through religious grandmothers, right? That the, the, the grandmothers are kind of continuing to reproduce the religion. On the other hand, you also have the failure to transmit correct atheist morality and values by parents who are themselves indifferent, right? They're indifferent to their children's upbringing, either because they're too focused on their career and so neglecting their children's kind of moral uh, upbringing or just as bad, and this usually is in reference to um, the women, they're transmitting their own bourgeois and Philistine values, right? And here you have um, uh, a mother and father kind of talking to each other while their daughter is praying to icons before an exam. And it says, Im mne vse ravno toliko bez dala naučne ateizem. Like, I don't care either as long as she passes her scientific atheist exam. So that, um, that's the kind of, uh, um, 
who, who is to blame. And as the party tried to understand why indifference was becoming a mass phenomenon, the stakes of the inability to produce atheist conviction came into focus. So the, the kind of the problem itself. If they failed to fill that sacred space at the center of the Soviet of Soviet ideology, it would be filled by alien ideolo ideologies, or it could be filled by alien ideologies and commitments. And these alien ideologies and commitments could indeed be in the form of traditional religion, so a kind of return to tradition and um, and the church and or or religious descent, but more often. What the party was noticing that these new spiritual commitments, right, that 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 these were new spiritual commitments um, that took on new and unusual forms. Um, hippie culture, the Hare Krishna, movements around charismatic leaders outside the official institution of the church, so um, like the Visarionovce, right, or various forms of esotericism, um, such as astrology or conspiracy theory or belief in aliens and Loch Ness monsters and yetis and, and UFOs, right, and here, um, I'll just give uh, one example of this. Um, is is an example of how like these kind of uh, new beliefs are just permeating Soviet and corrupting Soviet society. So you have these two kind of grandmas on the right and they're overhearing conversations and misinterpreting everything, right? So he said, you know, on the left, there's somebody who's saying to his girlfriend, and the grandmothers are saying, did you hear aliens, right? So, so and then, you know, this kind of, um, you know, game of telephone, which is then by the end, if you look here, right, being told to people as fact, right, that there are aliens and UFOs and so on. And um, just to kind of underscore this, you know, this is uh, by, um, you know, this kind of idea of ufology, um, and Alexander Panchenko has written terrific work on this, um, is, is, is by the late 1980s a kind of uh, a phenomenon. It's not, you know, um, not even a particularly marginal one. And it's just kind of in the soup of Soviet spiritual space. So finally, the, and so finally with this, the party realized that the atheist project actually had even bigger space, stakes, that the failure to fill that sp sacred space with spiritual Soviet spiritual content and to reproduce this over generations threaten the existence of the entire Soviet project. So that by the 1980s, this kind of spiritual problem and the problem of religion had in fact, again, become, um, become an, a political problem. Um, as the party tried to produce a unified Soviet society of convinced atheists, the production of, this, of a socialist way of life was seen as a critical tool for overcoming this ideological indifference and cultivating atheist conviction, especially among, among uh, Soviet young people. And so I wanna end by, by just pointing out that there was actually an, a Soviet socialist answer to these spiritual problems that was beginning to be articulated in the 1970s is really in the 19, um, uh, late 1970s and early 1980s. And I think one of the most um, kind of robust examples of this that I've encountered was um, this um, series of panels um, on the Soviet uh, way of life. And this is um, uh, from an article by Mariana Shachnovich, um, which talks about um, scientific atheism in the period of developed socialism. And here you see the Soviet way of life as this kind of colorful, saturated, you know, full of meanings and symbols uh, phenomenon, um, which consists of very distinct clear parts. So you have Soviet culture, right, this kind of secular culture, and you have um, socialist labor on the left and Soviet science, and of course, the cosmonauts and, and um, and doctors and, and uh, scientific technological revolutions. But then of course, finally also this idea of spiritual everyday life. So on the left here, um, uh, rituals, uh, that, that are supposed to take place in the village, right? So it's kind of Soviet rituals in the village. And on the right, uh, civic rituals that are really for an urban environment. And here, you know, it's rituals that really are meant to encompass 
every moment of a Soviet person's life from the cradle to the grave, right? So we're talking about from the, you know, from, from a kind of socialist uh, birth registration to the, you know, first bell, the Pierre Zvanok, to the, you know, inductions into various organizations, to the passport, to the marriage, to the induction into the labor force, right? So all of this is supposed to, um, kind of showcase a socialist way of life. And it was um, through these actually these socialist rituals that the party kind of put forward its most robust effort to articulate and inculcate um, um, the socialist way of life. Um, so that, um, um, again, I want to, so, so I'll just end here and say, that um, I think we have a quite complex situation in terms of how we understand Soviet spirituality, right? Because we do actually have a kind of ideological articulation of Soviet spirituality, which is this socialist way of life and socialist rituals. But we also have, have all sorts of other manifestations of uh, phenomena that we could categorize as spiritual, which I kind of went through, that are taking place in Soviet time and in Soviet space, right? And the question is, do we see these kind of in conversation with one another, in contradiction, um, and, and how do we kind of characterize that epoch as a whole? So I will stop there and um, I am happy to discuss with everybody. I'll, uh, I will exit out of this. Yes, thank you, Professor Smokin. Uh, it was very engaging, very interesting, and also very um, eye-opening in certain aspects uh, that we probably have not paid attention before. Uh, but now we would like to initiate or um, open uh, the floor or the screen, this virtual presence for discussion. So um, I'm sure that um, you do have questions. Probably uh, we, you could raise virtual hands and I will be attentive enough uh, to make down, um, uh, put down the, the, the order of uh, the questions. So um, yes, if, uh, if there are any questions, we, we, we can proceed. Maybe if others are still thinking, um, I would like uh, to ask with my first question, uh, because you, you showed us a lot of uh, visual media in terms of these uh, posters, which, were, which, were, which also had this uh, didactic function uh, that they had to teach how to, uh, how to proceed to this uh, ideal model of life. Um, could you also maybe um, uh, suggest, like, like any other forms of visual media, where these didactic uh, messages were integrated, probably like in film or, or, or uh, other, other sources of uh, inspiration, uh, especially for young people? Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting that, you know, there were um, films that were produced by, um, that were kind of ordered, right, um, um, uh, by, the, by the ideological establishment, um, you know, to, um, uh, you know, um, most film or, you know, the, the main um, um, studios to, usually the, these had to do with propagandizing the rituals, right? Showing Soviet people what these rituals were supposed to look like. Um, and, you know, they, they, there are examples of this, but they're not particularly, you know, um, moving or captivating. They're, they're kind of informational. Um, there were examples integrated into uh, some movies, actually, some films. Um, um, even I think if I remember correctly, and again, film is not something I, that I'm kind of, that I concentrate on, um, which is, means that there's so much work that could be done in film alone. Uh, but, you know, even in Kafkaska Plenitsa, and there's a kind of Soviet wedding going on, mm -hmm. there, that they're, um, that they're kind of, and they're kind of making fun of it, right? And the whole point of, of, um, 
the main character going to the Caucasus is he's an ethnographer, right? And he's collecting the traditions, which is exactly what the establishment, the ideological establishment is doing, right? They send out ethnographers and they're saying, okay, let's collect the traditions and create new traditions so that Soviet people can, can kind of continue to have these spiritual kind of experiences, but be divorced from their religious kind of institutional connections. So there, there was that, I think that's kind of a way more effective, right? Mm -hmm. um, way of communicating it because it's not so, you know, didactic and in your face. Um, cartoons and Krakadil, this, and I showed a couple of these, but they were, um, they were in there. But you know, what's interesting is the cartoons and Krakadil are mostly making fun of the atheists, right? They're not, um, and, and by the 60s, 70s, 80s, it's no longer considered very funny to be making fun of religious people, you know, this is like, not like the 20s and 30s. So you have to kind of also see that as a development, right? That, um, is 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 interesting in and of itself right that you're not even even the you're no longer even making fun of clergy right it's kind of not what you're supposed to be doing why because uh because they're no longer seen as this kind of political enemy right and even um you know they're they kind of have a they 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 have a right to exist right in this even in the soviet context um, so I would say, you know, there's th that, but really it's the idea of how these things spread is really through experiences. So for example, the one ritual, and I, you know, I could show you a hundred slides of this, but I won't, but, you know, the one ritual that was really kind of comprehensively um, articulated and practiced uh, was the wedding, right? The Soviet wedding. And people who were participating in it were not aware that they were participating in an ideological project, right? They were aware that they were going to a beautiful space, right? That, you know, allowed them to feel a certain kind of uh, solemnity to the occasion, that there was a space for them to have a party and a way to order music, right? All of these things, which didn't exist, that they no longer just had to go to the Zox and sign some paperwork. Um, you know, that didn't, you know, but that there was also like these other components, like going to the eternal flame, visiting the monuments. This was all articulated as a kind of part of this Soviet spiritual ritual, um, but not something that people understood to be didactic, right? And that's kind of why it was so, I think, um, pervasive. And more, most importantly, as a teaching tool, the main thing was people going to these weddings and then having their own weddings, right? So, so that's kind of how you encountered it was by going and it becoming a kind of a normal thing that you do. Um, so that by the 70s, it's kind of a normal thing, whereas in the late 50s, it's completely alien and foreign. So um, yeah, I would say it's kind of that, that part of mm -hmm. life that they emphasize. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. And we have the first question. Yes, please, could you proceed? That's the only hand that I can see. <laughs> thank you, thank you, uh, Ms. Mokin, for, for your report. I have a question. I'm sorry in advance for my English. It's not so good, but... Um, well, hey, if anybody wants to ask questions in Russian, that's totally fine. I, um, you know, I just, if, if that's better, I can... Um, I'll try. I'll yeah. try. <laughs> I have to start some. Uh, okay. Um, uh, someone. Uh, uh, what was the uh, the, the uh, topic of my PhD thesis? Is the uh, role of the commissioner of the Council uh, on Religious Affairs? And I, I have a question for you. What was, uh, according to you, the role of the commissioner, uh, uh, local commissioners? I, uh, for example, my thesis is about Donetsk region in Ukraine, but maybe you have another cases. What was the role of the uh, local commissioners uh, in the atheistic work? Was it crucial, real, or, or it wasn't uh, so, um, so crucial, so important? Yeah, no, I, that's a, it's a great question and it's a very important uh, point to make that the council and the commissioners really did not see it as their job to do atheist work. That was not how they understood their role. Their role was to make sure that laws were being observed, you know, ostensibly on both sides by the state and by the religious communities. Of course, heavily leaning to policing religious communities. Um, 
and and to and essentially kind of performing administrative functions, registering, um, making sure that people are paying taxes, but they did not see their role. I mean, I've you know I interviewed a number of people who were commissioners in various times, and they were very adamant that this was not our job, and they did not want it to be their job. Right, their job was to. Uh, focus on the religious communities as religious communities, not to actually transform those religious communities into atheist community. So I think this is something that's really important to keep in mind. And I kind of said this, I think, before this talk started in a conversation we were having that actually there were multiple logics at work, right? On the one hand, you have this kind of secular logic and these um, commissioners are really, I mean, I'm talking in general, right? Because of course it varied by, by every instance but but in general they're kind of secular figures right they're they're there to uh, make sure that the state controls religious institutions and that they remain within the parameters that the state itself sets right on the other hand you know there's the kind of ideological apparatus and that's not about secularity in my view that's about something else right that's about conversion transformation and so on so um i think the commissioners and atheist work they don't play any role and in fact um they they get quite annoyed sometimes by that kind of because they see atheist work as kind of sometimes violating the religious communities kind of um you know rights and feelings so thank you Yes, thank you uh, for the question and the answer. And now we have some questions in the chat. So the uh, first question is, um, is it possible to differentiate between Soviet spir spirituality as official and Soviet spirituality of alternative kind, like new religious movements, hippies movement, etc.? Mm -hmm. Oh, um, yeah, let me... You know, let me just, I forgot, I wanted to share something. Um, uh, one second. I just wanted to share, I have a, um, a list of sources um, that I think might be helpful here. Um, so I mentioned earlier in the talk, um, Juliana First's uh, Flowers Through Concrete, which is coming out in April. It's a new book, but I've read uh, a good portion of it already. Um, and I'm familiar with her work. Um, and, you know, there she sees, it's about the hippie movement. And she sees the hippie movement, not as a kind of other to the Soviet life, but really as kind of constituting and in conversation with Soviet, the Soviet system, which it kind of itself opposed, but also mirrored, right? So, so you can see these kinds of phenomena as both kind of trying to step outside of the Soviet system. Um, and, and a kind of, um, you know, I kind of think of them as kind of spiritual escape hatches, right? Like they're kind of, uh, you know, when the, you know, you're just trying to get out, right? There's no other way out. And this is a, this is a kind of possibility to get out. But at the same time, you're so shaped by this culture, right? And you're so shaped by the upbringing and the kind of that system that what you produce in your kind of effort to escape it oftentimes is, is you know, part of it, right? And in conversation with it. Um, I don't know that I have an answer. Um, I mean, I think you can definitely differentiate between official Soviet culture, like those panels that I showed of the, you know, socialist way of life or uh, socialist rituals. Um, I think you can absolutely differentiate between that and kind of hippie pilgrimages, right? Or, or um, uh, you know, or astro astrological kind of groups, right? Or yoga. Um, but, uh, but at the same time, the question I guess I posed at the beginning and that I would be, you know, that I think is more difficult to answer is, you know, which one of them is, is, is not Soviet, right? Like, can we see the kind of other ones as, as something other than Soviet? Is it possible to escape the Soviet um, in this, in this framework? So I, I don't know. Um, you know, I, I think it's a que I think it remains a question um, that, um, you know, and if it's not Soviet, then what is it really? Um, you know, it's it's um, 
you know, is there kind of a, a Soviet, a socialist way of, you know, being, you know, doing yoga and astrology as opposed to a capitalist one? I don't know, you know, so, so um, I think this is the, um, um, the question. I, I also wanted to just draw attention to a project, which I don't know if everyone here is aware of, um, which is at the top there, which is called New Age in Russia, um, uh, which is a, a really excellent project for precisely um, these New Age movements and thinking about their relationship with the official, but really concentrating on these kind of subcultures and countercultures and communities um, where um, uh, a number of authors uh, are here. Uh, or another article that is helpful here is um, Mitrokhin, Nikolai Mitrokhin's um, Sovietska Intelligentsia v Poiskach Chudos, so Soviet Intelligentsia in Search of Miracles, which looks at, um, and I'll, I'll stop sharing this, which, um, which looks at um, uh, kind of pseudoscientific movements, right? Um, and there, there it becomes quite difficult to differentiate between the Soviet and the not Soviet because the pseudoscientific movements are coming out of the kind of scientific technological intelligentsia. Um, so, you know, there I think it's, um, it's really a product of a certain kind of epistemology that is created in the Soviet system itself. Thank you very much. Yes, I see Mr. Uh, Johannes Dyke, but uh, first uh, there is Diana Popova. She uh, was unable to raise her virtual yes, hand. <laughs> because I'm probably the co-host, so it is ah, uh, okay. enable. Thank you, Victoria, for a very interesting talk. I'm not sure if it's a question, maybe just a commentary, but also you could uh, uh, reflect on that further. Uh, as I recently became interested in uh, researching superstitions and the so-called uh, beliefs in the Soviet period. So in your book, I found a really interesting episode where you mentioned that uh, the official ideology and the, the church had a one zone of overlapping interests and it was to fight this uh, occult or, or uh, popular belief. Mm -hmm. Could you maybe comment more? How did it, um, was there any possible directions it could develop or it was stopped in immediately? Was it somehow practically um, really, I, I was interested and it was eye opening for me actually that there was this one overlapping interest to uh, eliminate this particular part. But on the other hand, also Christianity became similarly treated and unwelcomed by the power. So finally they all ended as a, some sort of occult uh, category, I guess. Well, I, yeah, thank you so much for that question. It's a really interesting and um, complicated question. And I, I, the episode that you're referring to, I think, is when they're talking with the patriarch about closing the Kiva Pichersky Lavra, right? And they, and they're saying, oh yeah, of course, like we'll get rid of the kind of the old women, and it's no problem. They're just kind of like diabolical and and you know crazy, and um, so that's no problem. But we don't want you to close the the lavra, you know. <laughs> so um, you know, I'm not sure that the and this is a, a kind of um, this is a kind of a bigger point about Soviet history, and then I have another bigger point about kind of the relationship between religious institutions and you know popular practices and superstitions. I'm not sure that um, that religious institutions were cast into the category of the occult by the Soviet state. I think they were. Um, I mean, especially, you know, the Russian Orthodox Church, you know, I, I think they were really treated as political entities that could do certain work, especially abroad. And, you know, Nadezhda Bilakov, I think, is still here, so she could speak to this much more, you know, much more kind of expansively than myself. But they, you know, they were seen as, as political partners in some ways. Um, um, with whom you have to kind of cut deals, 
right? So they were, they were, they were people with whom you had to kind of negotiate. Um, and, you know, the, it was not an equal partnership, right, obviously, but they were not without their own power. And that's why they could actually push back on certain things within certain limits. Uh, but I think that this issue of popular practices, um, you know, th their interests there in some ways were aligned because they saw the popular practices as in a way um, threatening their own position, you know, by kind of, on the one hand, um, inspiring the wrath of the state, right? So they're kind of saying, okay, the state, it doesn't like this and we don't really like it either, but it's, if you continue to show this kind of public facing religiosity, it's gonna be bad for the church, right? So we need to kind of scale that back so that we can continue to kind of occupy the space we have, right? And not lose any further ground. Um, but also, you know, the, the kind of popular religiosity takes the authority spiritual authority away from the clergy, right? Because that's the whole thing is you're in direct communication with the spiritual there. You're you're at the place, right? You're at the, um, you know, and so it's either going, that charisma is either going to the local, you know, clerical or kind of local religious expert who is, you know, kind of negotiating between or mediating between the, the, you know, the people and this um, sacred site or sacred object or sacred person, or, um, you know, it, it's even without a kind of expert mediator and the people are kind of just themselves in communion or in communication. But in either case, the church is not being kind of acknowledged as the authority to sanction either kind of thing as sacred. So you could see it being from that perspective, a threat, right? Because it goes outside of its parameters. But I think more importantly, this is a point to the relationship between, you know, religious institutions and popular religiosity. This has always been a fraught relationship and this is not specific to the Soviet context and it's not specific to, you know, the Russian Orthodox church. But if you look at, for example, um, the Catholic church and the, um, um, the rise of um, of this kind of Marian um, devotion, right? Um, in uh, so, for example, like uh, Lords, right, and these miracles that begin to become popular pilgrimage sites in the late 19th century. The church's first reaction, the Catholic Church, is to stomp it out, right, and to say this is superstition. This is, you know, this is not you know, we did not sanction this until they realize that this is much, much more captivating, compelling and, and meaningful to people, you know, uh, because it has this kind of magical power, right, and, and a kind of unmediated um, connection with the, with the divine, right, or with the sacred. Um, you know, you could personally experience a miracle, not just be told about it, right? That they realize, oh no, we need to actually, you know, incorporate this, work with it, right? So, um, you know, that, but that's in a case where uh, the institution, the Catholic Church had a lot more autonomy, right? And a lot more room to kind of make these decisions. I don't think, I don't think the Orthodox Church could have, you know, brought the popular religion into its kind of framework and embraced it and defended it from the state. I just don't think it had enough political um, weight to be able to make a move like that. I think it does much more now, but that's, you know, that's separate. Yes, thank you very much. Really interesting comment as well. Yes, thank you. And we can proceed now to the next question. Um, it's my turn. Yes, please. Oh, thank you. Yeah, Victoria, I appreciate your talk. Thank you. Um, I think uh, I have to say the same what uh, uh, Karen uh, uh, Nikiforov said about my English, but I will uh, try to, to, to speak. Um, just uh, some uh, remarks. Um, when speaking about uh, Khrushchev's um, uh, campaign, um, I think uh, I have understood you correctly uh, that uh, it turned from uh, the church as a political enemy to an uh, ideological enemy. Uh, so uh, maybe 
uh, some results from uh, archival research. Um, at 1948, the situation with uh, all uh, the churches, uh, all the religious bodies um, turned to the uh, water situation. Uh, for example, um, um, the non-legal um, uh, free churches um, lost uh, a lot of people uh, in uh, Latvia, and uh, we are speaking about Riga. For example, the Baptists uh, lost uh, two or three of their bishops, uh, uh, bishops. They were sent uh, into exile to Siberia. Uh, so we had, um, uh, beginning with Khrushchev, uh, beginning with uh, 1958, uh, um, massive uh, administrating campaign mm -hmm. um, about, uh, to, to some statistics, uh, to one third of um, uh, churches were closed. Uh, we had um, uh, persecutions uh, and uh, at least uh, one victim in uh, Siberia. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, this uh, uh, turned at least the political uh, uh, situation of the country. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know, but maybe it is legitimate to speak uh, about a failure of uh, Khrushchev's religious politics mm -hmm. and um, Brezhnev's politics and new politics uh, as a kind um, of a, a new attempt to, to, to cope with the religion, but with the different uh, means. So just some, uh, some reactions to, uh, to your talk. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. That's um, there are a number of really important and valuable interventions there. Um, you know that you know I kind of in giving kind of a general picture, you lose a lot of the specificity and nuance. But I I um, I do want to pause on one of the um, one of the things that um, you brought up, which is the specific situation of the Baltics. Um, which is absolutely, you know, of course, since I'm speaking to an audience in the Baltics is especially significant here. I actually, I have not done much work in Latvia, but I have done quite a bit of work in the archives in Estonia and Lithuania. And from there, I can say that, you know, the, the situation um, after the war and, and, and even under uh, the Khrushchev era is quite distinct in the Baltics because of Sovietization, right? Because of the need to pacify. So in a way the Baltics, like as, as with, as with uh, you know, West Ukraine and, and, and um, other incorp areas that were annexed after the war, they find themselves in a way experiencing what the kind of Soviet heartland experienced in the thirties, right? Which is this kind of Sovietization, pacification, um, uh, repressions. Um, so that's the situation on the Western borders are is much more um, fraught in the post in the first year that, that decade of after the war, right? So while kind of in the heartland, you have, you know, churches, Orthodox churches being opened and kind of, you know, a kind of a little bit of a relaxation, um, and then a kind of return to closing the churches with Khrushchev, but still, you know, not quite the level of repression that you saw before. Um, in the Baltics, you're seeing, you know, this is an incredibly repressive period with exile and um, and uh, arrests and and so on. So I think it's important to note that. And I think the place where I found that to be most kind of counterintuitive and interesting is when I was looking at materials in Lithuania, for example, during the Khrushchev era the the one place where they weren't closing orthodox churches was lithuania so so in that context right they're closing half of the orthodox churches in the russian republic under this khrushchev campaign that's very aggressive and they're closing catholic churches in lithuania 
but they're actually opening Orthodox churches, right? Because they're trying to use the Orthodox church to Sovietize that area. So in a way you kind of see the kind of political instrumentality at work. So it isn't just these kind of ideological campaigns, but it's also, you know, how they can be leveraged in specific political situations to, you know, to do other kinds of work. So I think that, you know, I really appreciate you bringing that up because I think it's so important to keep in mind the diversity of that, or, you know, in West Ukraine where they just outlawed the, the, the Greek Catholics and, you know, that was that. So um, it's quite different um, and distinct. Yes, thank you. So um, uh, if there are any other questions or, or comments, please, you're very welcome to ask. If I may ask, thank yes, you, Victoria. Please. Thank you, Victoria, for your lecture and for your book. It's great. Um, but I was thinking um, about uh, whether anti-religious propaganda was uh, during Khrushchev directed uh, most mainly uh, towards um, Christian Christianity and Orthodox Church, or maybe you would um, say, was there anything special directed towards Judaism? Because I'm 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 just uh, researching the yeah. Jewish religious life, so I was thinking about this question. Yeah, that's that's a great that's a great question, um, and it's a complex answer. And I, I you know I imagine you have already some of that answer just in your background. But the Khrushchev campaign, it, it really it was kind of the, the situation with Judaism was quite distinct and apart from the situation with um, with orthodoxy or with Christianity more broadly, um, because the, the the repression of of Judaism in the post-war period was really connected with the founding of the state of Israel and with Zionism. And so, you know, the, the, the most of the religious institutions and repressions, that, uh, the kind of closing of religious institutions, that had already happened by the time you get to Khrushchev, right? So there wasn't anything to close of, you know, of any kind of, of any weight. Um, and really what you see in the Khrushchev era, and really not just, I would say even after the Khrushchev, in the early Brezhnev era, in the mid 60s, is the kind of mobilization of Jewish people around Israel, right? And a kind of a dissident movement, but that's something a little bit distinct. Now they, you know, it is articulated in terms of religious repression and the inability to practice their faith and so on. But, you know, it's, it's, um, it's attacked by the state as a form of nationalism and Zionism, not as a religion. So it's a little bit, it's framed um, as something apart from the Soviet project, right? In a way as kind of like something that cannot be integrated into the Soviet project in the way that orthodoxy can. I don't know if that, hopefully that addresses at least some of your kind of question. Yes, thank you very much. I just want to hear your thoughts. Thank you. Yes, thank you for the question and the answer. Any other questions or comments? No, <laughs> everybody's thinking over all this uh, very valuable material. I have made a lot of notes personally, many things to check the directions. So very thoughtful, uh, thought encouraging. Thank you so much. Yes, and uh, some uh, Feel free if anybody, I should say, you know, um, as, I, as I open the talk that, um, you know, it is quite different not to physically be there and to have the conversation really contained in this quite, you know, specific time and space. Um, so I just want to kind of say that if anybody has thoughts or questions um, that they would like to ask later, you please feel free to follow up with me. Yes, thank you so much. Yes, that would be uh, very useful if we could use your, your assistance. Yes, so um, mostly we have thank you notes and uh, we all appreciate, um, yes, your, your, your talk and, uh, and virtual presence. So um, yes, it looks like there are no more questions. Am I right? Yes. 
So no more urgent questions to ask. 